I'm the person who heads up outreach at Balliol. And tonight I'm joined by Tianchi, who is one of our graduates. So just a few reminders, uh, as you probably remember from our emails, we are recording this session and for your privacy, the microphones and cameras have been turned off. But we do encourage you to interact and get involved in this workshop. So you can do that by using the chat function. Uh, if you're not familiar with that and you're not used to Teams, don't worry. Normally it's an icon that appears at the top of your screen, a speech bubble. And it says chat underneath. So do please uh, interact, get involved if you can. So the format tonight will be a brief introduction from Tianchi, who will just tell you a little bit about her own research and interests and journey. Then we're going to have the workshop itself. And then after that, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask for any further questions if you're particularly interested in this area. So I think, Tianchi, it's time for me to hand over to you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I will start sharing my screen first before I get to my. Um, yeah, now if you can all see the slides. OK, so hello. Yeah, we my... can see them, Tianchi, don't worry. OK, thank you very much. Hello, my name is Tianchi and I'm uh, currently a third year DPhil student in the University of Oxford. I am in the Department of Biology. It used to be Department of Zoology when I first got enrolled. So I'm uh, studying zoology. I'm focusing on the evolution of guppy fish in Trinidad. They are a wild fish living in freshwater streams and they're tiny and they evolve really quickly. And well, they're not really an animal species with mimicry skills, but animal mimicry is what I'm talking about today. And what got me interested in biology, and especially the animals, is uh, probably like some of you, if you're not, uh, if you're interested in biology as well, is the wonderful real life examples we actually get to see in the wild, in zoos and in museums and also in the documentaries. And we've got so many amazing experts and explaining to us how nature um, have there's just so many amazing examples of animals that have all sorts of amazing skills and animal mimicry being one of them. So um, I studied my undergrad. Uh, I had my undergrad degree also in biological science in China, and then I came here to keep working in this direction. And uh, topic today, animal mimicry, I've mentioned it already. And we will be we will be learning about three different things. First is the definition of animal mimicry and also some different types of uh, animal mimicry and also the advantages and costs of animal mimicry. So before we begin, um, I'm not sure. Have you seen the pre reading material? The I think it's a two minute YouTube video uh, and shared the link with you early. So. Can you please type in the chat if you haven't or if you have seen it, like a yes or a no? I'm afraid I can't really see um, hands up now. So uh, instead of a reaction, can you please? We're getting oh, some thinking. yeses, Tianchi, so that's good news. <laughs> yeah, good. I'm seeing it as well. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. So, oh, I'm forgetting about this. Um, so if you're interested in exploring the topic, because I personally work on animals rather than plants, so I don't know that much about plant mimicry, but there are also ma uh, many amazing examples of plant mimicry. So if you're interested in that, I have some links uh, in the end and also some real life examples that you can visit to see more uh, examples of animal mimicry. So um, I'm getting yeses here. But just in case you haven't watched the video, there are seven different animal species uh, mentioned in the video, and two of them are butterflies and two. Oh, I can't even remember whether this is a mantis or not. Let's just say two different uh, mantis species and hoverfly, a moth and a caterpillar. And I had a question in my pre-reading material. How many different types of mimicry skills do you think were there in the video? One or two or three or more. Obviously, there are seven different species, but 
do you think we can somehow categorize them into maybe one or two or more different types of mimicry? Um, maybe some of them are achieved in one way, some of them achieved in another way. If you have some idea about this question, can you please type that in the chat as well? I'm getting a two here. And why do you think so? Oh, two. They make another animal or plant. Defensive and predatory. Oh, we're getting very professional answers here. Color and shape. Colors, pattern, shape, behavior. Oh, well done. And blending with the environment, one being other animals. Yep. Yep. So, so I'm getting many great answers, really. I wasn't expecting some of them, but they are. Um, I've uh, I've done this a very similar a very similar uh, session on the same topic with younger students, and obviously they did not have uh, the same knowledge background as you did. But uh, this is really nice. This is amazing reaction that I'm uh, getting to uh, from you. So. Um, for me personally, we can say that there's only one type of mimicry. They're all animal mimicry, like I've mentioned before, and also plant mimicry, but I'm not really talking about it today, except this one example here. I've got an uh, orchid plant that the flower really looks like a female moth, so it wants to attract male moths to come here and to stay on the flower and to uh, get the pollination done. So that's an example of the plant mimicry, but I don't know that much about plant mimicry. But all the other seven examples uh, shown in the video are animal mimicry, and they're all insects. There are so many other animal species uh, that can do mimicry as well, but they all happen to be insects, and we will be looking at different uh, species later. This is another example. I took this photo in the London Zoo, and this is called giant stick insect. You can see why. Just in case you're still not seeing them, um, there are three, oh, so many actually, insects and staying on sticks, and they look like sticks, so they are blending into the background. And if you see them in the wild, you don't necessarily notice them. That's another example of insect animal mimicry. And, oh, sorry, I should have given you a warning beforehand, snake coming up. So this is another example of a uh, snake and fish species with mimicry skills. You might think that they don't necessarily look like each other. And we will get to that later about why they don't necessarily really look like each other, but still we call it animal mimicry. And they all look like something else. That's another way of defining or categorizing them into only one type of mimicry because they can sound like something else or they can smell like something else. Again, we will get to this later. And two, I think some of you mentioned this, that uh, some of them are prey. Uh, most of them are actually prey species. Only one of them is a predator. It's trying to get the prey by pretending to be a flower part of the plant. And most of them are trying to stay away or uh, make the predator think that they are not edible when uh, the encounter with the predators. Another way of dividing them into two different categories is some of them are about getting attention. I think uh, one of you mentioned this as well. Uh, some of them are trying to avoid the predators just staying low key, trying to blend in to the background while others are using more alerting uh, colors and try to terrify the uh, predators or to, to make them believe that they're another harmful or poisonous animal. And another way of uh, dividing them into two different types, I think you've mentioned this as well in the chat. Some of them are pretending to be another animal, while others are mimicking part of a plant. And can you think of any disadvantages of an animal mimicking a plant or a part of a plant? 
what's the cost? That herbivore might eat them. Oh, I haven't thought about that before, but that's a really nice answer. And also, uh, they must remain still. Energy needed. Failure to breed by blending into one. <laughs> These are really professional answers. Seriously, I, I wasn't. You guys are just amazing. I, I really wasn't expecting this, but well done. And you've been thinking in different aspects uh, from the reproduction, from the energy consumption, from the uh, costs, and just very, very impressive. I'm truly impressed. This is, um, well, it's just such amazing answers I'm getting from you. Thank you so much. This is working so much better than I thought. And um, yeah, and with that in mind, we can can you just take a few seconds to think? Maybe there are other types of animal mimicry skills, and we will get to the next slide. So this is the first example mentioned in the video. It's the African queen butterfly, and I've got some description from its Wikipedia, and you can take one minute to have a look. You can notice I've marked something in black and another species in green, another one in gray. So this is basically saying that the African queen butterfly is being mimicked by different species and uh, they look like each other so that predators cannot tell them apart and that is beneficial for the other species to look like an unpalatable species like the plain tiger. And I'm marking this one, the one being mimicked in black, and the ones that are mimicking uh, the toxic species in green and also the predator in gray because that's the three key components or the three different roles we need in order for a mimicry system to work. And here are some of the other species mentioned in the Wikipedia. The one on the left is the African queen butterfly and there are three different other species. They all look like them, but again, just like the snake and the fish example I've shown you earlier, if you I believe if you take 10 minutes to look at them, you can probably find five, 10 different uh, differences between the actual model animal and the mimics. But they're not really trying to fool us to believe that they are the African queen. They're actually only trying to fool the predator, in their case, the bird, to believe that they belong to the same species and therefore the bird will not be eating these three species as well as the African queen butterfly as soon as the bird uh, has learned that the African queen butterfly is not really good food choice. So there are three different roles in the, in the mimicry system, being a model and being mimic. And a dupe doesn't necessarily have to be a predator, sometimes it can be a prey as well. And that's a very typical example of a Bayesian mimicry. Here I've got, again from Wikipedia, the definition of two different types of mimicry, and they are very uh, class examples, if you're very interested in biology, maybe you've come across them already somewhere. It's Bayesian mimicry and Mullerian mimicry. And again, you can take a minute to look at the differences between these two concepts. So the main difference is that a Bayesian mimicry is a harmless or not so harmful species trying to mimic a harmful species, while the malarian mimics are two or more harmful species trying to mimic each other. And this question is based on a research paper published decades ago. And uh, the author mentioned six premises of a Bayesian mimicry. And in his 
uh, research, he defined some of them to be essential for the Bayesian mimicry. And I, I'm going to ask you to try to identify which ones you think are essential for Bayesian mimicry. But uh, there's not a very clear, there's not one correct answer to this question because the definition of Bayesian mimicry keeps changing. And what the author believed to be correct, some of them we don't really believe that anymore. So uh, don't worry if you get it wrong. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just we have different opinions from the author. But there was one correct author, uh, one correct choice based on the author. Some of these six premises, and he and he thought are essential for basic mimicry. Can you please type in the chat which ones you think are essential for Bayesian mimicry to work? Now remember, Bayesian mimicry is different from Malarian mimicry. I'm getting some answers here. I think all of you included A, B, C, and F. Some of you included uh, D or E. Okay, I'm going to give you the answer. A, B, F. These were the three essential ones according to the author, but um, but we don't necessarily have to agree with what he said. Uh, I think you've all got A and B, and that's uh, part of the definition of species model. It's unpalatable to predators, and the second species and then it's palatable but resembles the model. And most of you have got C as well. The mimics are less abundant than the models. This definitely helps if um, if it, it is the situation. But if it's the other way around, the mimics are more abundant than the models, then it depends on how uh, the predator learns that uh, you should not eat certain species. If it's in our gene already, just like our fear for a snake and some other uh big mammals are we don't necessarily have to have someone to teach us that they're dangerous animals we just naturally try to avoid them it's the same with some species that they naturally just know by instinct that some species are not edible and some are harmful so if they already know that and then the mimics doesn't necessarily have to be less abundant than the models but if the predators only learn through experience that after eating one or two uh, African queen butterfly or any toxic or unpalatable species, only after that they learn that you should not eat it, then it's very important for the mimics to be less abundant than the models because if it's the other way around, then the predator doesn't really necessarily learn to link the toxic a trait with the color pattern or whatever that the mimic was trying to uh, replicate from the model. And D, some of you got D as well. The mimic must be found at the same place and time as the models. Doesn't necessarily have to be at the same place or time. It can be in different places if the predator, well, again, doesn't necessarily have to be the predator, the, uh, the one, the third role in the system if it moves from one place to another and then after learning from the first place that uh, this is the unpalatable species and then it moves to the second place and well it's still working 
and also it's same uh it doesn't have to be at the same time you can learn uh or just by instinct it knows that it's not edible and then three months later one year later it still knows that you should not eat certain animals with certain color pattern and then e the model and the uh, mimic are conspicuous or readily seen by uh, potential predators. Most of you did not put this one in, so uh, it doesn't have to blend necessarily have to blend into the background. It can just stand out and try to scare it off. And F, the predators learn to asso or associate uh, unpalatability with color pattern of the model. I think most of you, probably all of you got this one in as well, and the authors got it as well. And this is one example that I I, I said uh, we keep uh, the definition of Bayesian mimicry keeps evolving. It doesn't have to be color pattern anymore. It can also be other chemical signals that you can smell or uh, you can sense. But well done you were getting very close to what the author believed to be correct and you also have your own opinion about what makes um what are the essential um premises for Bayesian mimicry and the concept keeps evolving it's the same for malaria mimicry as well you can see it got its name just the same way uh, as the uh, Bayesian mimicry because of the first person who mentioned the concept or we define the concept. The first person restricted to only uh, distantly related species that have evolved similar color patterns. Again, doesn't have to be color patterns anymore. And then later, another researcher, Wallace, expanded this concept to include closely related forms or members of the same genus with similar uh, color patterns. And you can also see why they ruled out the members from the same genus in the first place, because if they belong to the same genus, then they're somehow closely related, and it's natural for them to share a very similar uh, color pattern. But then the concept keeps changing, and the different researchers keeping having uh, debates and uh, argues over how you should define certain concepts, and that's what makes science keeps growing and developing. And I have another question here. If you still remember what is molarian mimicry, uh, it's two different palatable species, unpalatable species mimicking each other. Why would they do that? Can you try to think and answer and type it in the chat? What's the point in two unpalatable species trying to mimic each other if they're already unpalatable? You can definitely see the benefit for a palatable species trying to mimic an unpalatable one. Anyone's got any idea? To seem even more unpalatable? Increase protection as they all look alike. Predators does not need to learn not to eat both. That's the explanation I was planning to give you, because uh, that in, uh, that is an increased protection because the um, predator. Again, I'm talking about predator doesn't necessarily have to be predator, but the third role, or let's say the predator in the system. It can only it only needs to meet one of these two unpalatable species to learn that it's harmful and it's not edible. Um, it doesn't need to kill one of each species to learn that oh you should not eat this one. So they share the benefit that the uh, other species bring to this species as well. So um, it's good for the population, not necessarily good for the individual. The individual has a reduced risk of getting killed. So for the uh, population, makes it more beneficial. 
And here I'm bringing in another concept. It's camouflage. Camouflage is a concept that's somehow very uh, close to animal mimicry. And this is just another definition from the evolutionary bio biological point of view that mimicry is an evolved resemblance between an organism and another object. The same object, we often actually mean living creature, another animal or a plant. And evolved resemblance means that it has to be passed on somehow by the genetics so that if the parents benefit from looking like another different animal, then the child has to inherit that resemblance as well. And then to benefit from that again as well to increase the likelihood of um, reaching adulthood and having its own children. And therefore, the, uh, this trait can be passed on to the next generation, keeps going, and that's how you have an evolved mimicry. But camouflage, there are three different examples of animal camouflage. First one is an insect looking like a stone, and the second one is an octopus blending into the seawater, and probably seawater. This is the snow leopard blending into the snow and the mountain. And camouflage and mimicry are two different concepts. But what is the relationship between the two different concepts? And I have definition of animal camouflage as well. Well, I think this also includes human camouflage. And you might have seen this uh, graph before in math classes. What do you think is the relationship between mimicry and camouflage? Is mimicry a type of camouflage or is camouflage a special type of mimicry or they're two slightly different concepts but they share something in common? Oh, sorry, I just accidentally revealed the answer that there are two slightly different concepts. I think most of the answers I'm getting either A or C. So um, there are two different concepts because you can find examples of mimicry that doesn't really belong to animal camouflage. For example, the ones that are standing out, um, like the African queen butterfly is not really looking like any background or it's not really blending in. But that's definitely animal mimicry of two species, more species mimicking each other. And you can also find some examples that belong to camouflage, but doesn't really feel like mimicry. I have another example here, the rabbit blending into the snow. It would be quite strange if you say the, sn uh, the rabbit is mimicking the snow. We don't really say that, but that's a very typical example of animal camouflage. So there are two different concepts and they share something in common. Obviously, there are so many examples we just mentioned, like this thing here, it's a camouflage. But, uh, but if you say it's, this insect is also mimicking a stone, well, I don't know if someone might agree. Someone might say that it's not mimicry. But if you see uh, the mantis looking like an orchid, that's definitely both a camouflage and a mimicry. And it's the same for the moth that looked like a twig. That's also both the camouflage and the mimicry. And I have another example here, the eye spot on moth and butterflies. To, uh, for some researchers, that's not an example of Bayesian mimic. But for me, that is a Bayesian mimic. So you can see different researchers have different opinions of, about what is an uh, example of animal mimicry, what is not. And it's the same for animal, animal camouflage. You might There might be debates about what is uh, the definition of camouflage, what is an example of camouflage, what is not. Um, and that's, again, that's what keeps science developing. You have to have different opinions and you have to try to prove, or at least want to prove that you're correct and 
um, it's the nice friendly debate that keeps science developing because you um, need to find more evidence to support your own, own opinion and you have to work in the lab or work in the field to find evidence and that process just uh, keeps helps us find more and more knowledge and information about the nature and the animals the plants and another biologist Ari Fisher he called uh, animal mimicry, the greatest post-Darwinian application of natural selection. That's a great compliment. And as science kept developing and we kept finding more and more examples of animal mimicry, now we can categorize them into more different um, categories. If we divide animal mimicry by function, we can actually see that some of them are aggressive, some of them are protective, some of them are reproductive and some of them are mutualistic. And also we have uh, examples of mixed function animal mimicry. And this firefly here, um, it's an animal species that try to mimic the, the, the frequency of the light signal from uh, of another firefly. And I believe the... Oh yes, so uh, the the model and the mimic. So the model species is using this certain sequence as a signal to attract females, but the mimic species, the one that's copying the other species behavior, is actually using this signal to try to attract the males or the females um, by using the same signal, but actually try to uh, attack them when they arrive following the signal. And so that's an aggressive um, mimicry, just like the mantis that look like the flower we've seen earlier in the video. And this is a cuttlefish. And this one's very interesting. <laughs> this one is a male trying to uh, look like a female because uh, in this species, the males are usually large and aggressive and they uh, have their own territory and they have their own uh, female individuals living in their territories. But some male species, instead of entering the fierce competition between the very large males, they actually try to be small and try to pretend that they're female. And they get into the territory of one of the big, strong uh, male competitors, and they just try to pretend to be a female. And when the other male is not paying attention, these small males just trying to mate with the, not necessarily mate, but to try to make uh, fertilize the eggs of the other fi uh, females. So that's a technique of reproductive mimicry. And also by method, all the, mess uh, all the ex uh, examples we've seen earlier, they're optical, they all look like another species, but uh, there are also other chemical mimicries. You can release chemical signals like the pheromones for insects. You can smell like another uh, species again to attract mainly the male individuals to attract them and try to eat them and also acoustic including ultrasonic this is this happens in some bat uh, species also trying to attract uh, trying to mimic the ultrasonic signal frequency of another bat species and also tactile this is happening in oh I have pictures here so the moth are an example of chemical mimicry. They release the pheromone that smell like another species. Acoustic, also some birds and some bats. And the tactile ones, some ants, um, when they use their antennae, sometimes they also try to feel like another species, but they're not. And I have a video here. And let me know if not working you cannot hear it but i shall try to play it what makes the mimic so special is not how it looks but how it acts the mimic octopus gets its name because it likes to take on various shapes that some people think is mimicry for example when the mimic octopus travels across the sand it takes on the shape and color of a flounder a flounder is a flat fish that blends into the sea floor. It swims like a magic carpet just above the sand. Is the mimic octopus trying to look like a flounder? 
or just taking on a shape which is universally effective for camouflage over sand. But not all of its behaviors are camouflage. Sometimes the mimic octopus dons stripes and walks along with its arms sticking out like the spines of a lionfish. Is it trying to frighten away predators with a lionfish impersonation? Because this is definitely not camouflage. Sometimes the mimic swims quickly by adopting a torpedo shape. But it also puts on a display of stripes, making some biologists convinced it's trying to look like a venomous sea snake. Okay, so that's another video example of the amazing animal mimicry skill. Um, the same example, there's also a research paper on that, and it, that was included in my pre-reading material as well. Um, and if you've seen that paper, if you've had a look at the website, uh, that paper is actually a rather simplified version of a research paper, and but it has this very similar structure. So if you're interested in studying uh, biology, for your undergrad degree, then that's what you will be doing uh, for not most of the time, but a lot of the time you will be reading many researchers, uh, research, research papers just like that one. So it's about 50, 50, 50 time, 50% 50 of the time will be spent on reading these papers and 50% of the time will be working in labs or in the field, trying to work on the species or population or whatever you're interested in. Uh, so that gives you a nice taste of what it's like to be a biology undergrad. So now getting back to animal mimicry, they may exist at the molecular level or the organ um, or um, the individual level. All the examples we've seen before, they're not uh, on molecular level, but for some parasites, it can happen at a much, much lower level. And the durability of mimicry varies from permanent to less than one second. So before this video, all the examples we've seen, they are permanent um, mimicry, if I remember correctly. Did we see any? Did we see any? No, they're probably all permanent. And But this octopus, this is an, an excellent example of a very swift change. So it can actually mimic different animals throughout its life. And it happens more frequently in some marine species because uh, changing colors, the pigment, the way uh, their body structures work are just slightly different from the land animals. What makes them mimic? And here I have the resource links for the pre-reading video example of some plant mimicry and a scientific research paper. This is the one I'm talking about, about the mimic octopus and some real life examples. So I'm going to show you two other photos I've taken from an uh, Oxford Museum of Natural History and also from London Zoo. They have an amazing tiny giant's house where you can just see or <laughs> you, you will not see the animals because they blend in so well to the background. And this is another example. I think this is at London Zoo as well. You can type something if you found what's the animal inside the picture. It's quite difficult to find, especially if you don't know what you're looking for. There's only one insect or one I saw when I took this photo and you if you found it then it looks quite obvious but if you haven't it might take a few sec uh it might take a few seconds or a few minutes sometimes even hours to try to find them so it's amazing all the examples we've uh, seen I've got some amazing photos and some amazing videos from researchers because they try to capture um, the moment of these amazing creatures. But actually, when you think about it, they live in the wild and it's uh, some of the mimicry's aim is to blend into the background. So their aim is actually to to be uh, to not be 
spotted by any one of us. So we might have missed so many amazing examples in animal mimicry. And if they're doing it really to the perfect level, we will never notice them probably, even if we just walk right past them in the wild, we don't necessarily see. So you're probably, most of you have probably seen it already. This is what it looks like when it's not blending into the green leaves. For the one on the left, this is where it is. You can see the tail actually look like a broken leaf. So after probably millions of years or thousands of years um, of evolution, I don't think we have a very clear study on the exact length it takes, uh, length of time it takes for an animal to evolve a certain uh, mimicry trait because it's quite tricky to study that. But obviously to evolve something like that, a tail like that, like a broken leaf, it, it's going to take a long, long time. And here I have another example, sorry, of a leaf insect. and. <laughs> What I love about this photo is that I can no longer remember what was the in, where was the insect, but I definitely had an insect somewhere in this photo. I just can't remember where it was anymore. Maybe more than one, maybe two or three, but I cannot even find one single insect in this picture. And this is the last page of my slide today. So if you if you have any questions or if you have any um, maybe questions about animal mimicry, maybe questions about studying biology or what it's like to be in the university. Feel free to ask them in the chat and I will be more than happy to answer them. Or if you can just try to find the leaf in effect. I, I've spent years trying to look at this image and I could never find it. Thank you so much, Tianchi. That was fascinating. So, uh, as you say, if there if there are any questions you want to ask relating to the material, um, please do go ahead because we have a few minutes. Okay, I see the questions coming. Through. What opportunities do I get at university to pursue your own research abroad? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, because my I started my undergrad in China and then came here, so it, it my experience is probably slightly different from what you might get in the future. But for me, I had a exchange program in I think it's the summer between my the first year and the second year of my undergrad. I came here to Oxford. I actually wasn't planning to be an Oxford PhD at that time. I just thought I would just come here, see what Oxford is like and then just get back and try to apply to probably an American university. I, I didn't really know, but honestly, I wasn't expecting. But anyway, I had the experience. I knew what it's like to study here. But still, after <laughs> after going back, I wasn't really planning to apply because I know it's a very nice university and chances of me getting in is rather low. But luckily, <laughs> uh, in the last year, I think this is a very similar process for um, universities here in the UK and also back at, uh, at home in the fourth year of your degree you do more lab work and you find supervisors who also um, guide PhD students and also master students um, about their independent research and they will also guide you as an undergrad to find your own um, research program but you can just finish in a few months time or one year's time and um, it was at that time that you actually start seriously looking at different labs think about what you're interested in and what you want to do if you want to do a PhD not many people want to do a PhD if you want to do a PhD and if you want to maybe stay in academia or you just want to do a PhD and then move on to a different area or get a job in the industry you want to think about what you're interested in because um, a PhD <laughs> takes several years so you have to find something that you're truly passionate about 
and you just want to keep exploring, you want to keep reading what other people have done about this and what you want to do uh, in the lab or in the field. So uh, the final years in as an undergrad or the last few months, they're quite important for um, and also my supervisor at that time, he helped me a lot when I was trying to, uh, you know, recommend myself to professors in the universities. So he also helped me a lot before deciding and eventually coming to study abroad. And yeah, to just keep looking if you're interested in such opportunities. And have humans ever shown any sign of mimicking or copying animals? That's an excellent question. I don't know, honestly, because if you think about the question um, from the biolog uh, from the evolutionary <laughs> biologist's point of view, like I've mentioned previously in the slides, they think it and mimicry has to be an evolved behavior or evolved trait. So, and um, takes a while for human to evolve because we're very complicated mammals. So, if we're talking from that perspective, then no, because we don't have enough time to evolve so that every human being knows, say, if we see a snake, a poisonous snake, then we try to behave like a, I don't know what species will help us, monkey or a mantis or something. <laughs> but um, if you define animal mimicry in a different way, like the octopus one, if you just mimic one animal for one second, somewhere in your life and I assume most of us if not all have mimicked animals in some way and what is my favorite organism that uses mimicry another good question I'm very tempted to say guppies but guppies don't really mimic other animals guppies is my favorite uh, are my favorite animals uh, because I work on them and I love them um, but they, unfortunately, they don't really mimic other species. So I probably say the octopus one because, well, I'm, I just like it when it can mimic more than just one species. And my favorite example. Oh, we can see someone sharing their favorite example. Butterfly that mimics the eye of an owl. Also, there are more more species i think also some moth can do that as well so if you're interested in it you can just go and have a look maybe you can find different animal species that has the ability to do that you can do a little comparison between different species and um and i also know there's one type of butterfly that uh, the wing are have two different co uh, the wings have two different colors on both sides i can't remember i think when it's um the outside is very bright blue color and the inside the eye spots so when it opens the wing it scares off predators and when it's flying the bright uh blue side when it's flying obviously it's moving and the reflection of sunlight makes it rather distracting so it's a um, very effective way of trying to make the predators feel confused by what are you Oh, and you saw it in person. That must be very impressive. Any other questions? What are if there are some examples of symbiotic mimic mimicry between different species? That's a nice question. And honestly, I don't have a very clear answer to that question. You can probably try to do a little bit of research yourself, try to find some websites or maybe research papers. And I I also need to do more reading myself on that area. And thank you for asking that. I need to have more look. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in, in this topic, then do find more things to read, to watch, to explore, and 
Well, eventually, maybe one day that will be your research area. I don't know. And what is field work like? Um, yeah, you can just check the link and see what it's like to be an undergraduate student. But for me, field work is it varies greatly depending on which area you're going. Some are some people. My supervisor, he went to the very wet uh, Scottish islands, and I went to the very dry and hot uh, tropical area. And also for my undergrad, I also went to the mountainous area in China as well. So it's different environment, completely different. Some of them are very tough and dangerous. Some of them are more mild, but it's still you have to keep working. Some, sometimes you try to set the cameras to track the African lions or the Yellowstone wolves um, for the large uh, uh, mammals that you don't necessarily capture them. But for the guppies that I'm working on, we try to collect them. We try to catch them without hurting them at all every single month to check are they getting larger, are they getting smaller. I'm not saying that the individuals are shrinking, I'm just saying the average population uh, average body size in a population are they getting larger or smaller um yeah so it's different method so for the guppies obviously you have to stand in the stream and try to catch the fish and that's a very interesting but also very challenging process as well and yeah it, it varies depending on which environment or which animal you're interested in or which plant you're interested in or even viruses and bacteria, you might be collecting different samples. Oh, another nice question. If a model species is extinct, what will happen to the mimic species? It is hypothetical, but what do you think? Do you think, do you think the mimic species will die out as well? eventually, if we're talking about the Bayesian mimicry rather than the Mullerian mimicry, because I guess Mullerian mimicry was very unusual. I'd say it's rather unusual for the model species to die out first, but it's possible uh, if there are some other traits, not necessarily the color pattern, maybe the model species just naturally needs more food to keep surviving and then it dies out and then the predators might if it's for Bayesian uh, mimicry the, the predator might just eventually realize that oh this color pattern is not harmful at all so starts eating more and more of the mimic species and eventually they'll die out as well or maybe for the Mullerian um, species like some of you have mentioned earlier they are actually competing against each other somehow so if one dies out, the more uh, the other will just might conquer more territory or might occupy more food resource, or they might die out as well because they are somehow limited by the same environmental factors. Maybe it's the temperature. Both of them cannot stand very low or very high temperature, so they one one species die and the other one die as well. So it is very good to have these. Um, hypothetical questions because it keeps you thinking what the si different situations might be because we never know what um, evolution will be like in 10, 20 years time for animals. Will the global climate be better, be worse? What is like, will more animal species die out in a terrible speed? We don't really know. And if the predators would notice the difference if newer generation live without being threatened by model species and learn to avoid them. Yeah, that's also a good question. So if the newer generation do not learn from their parents' experience, if that is not passed on through genetics or through the parental teaching of some large mammals, um, then there's very little or no benefit at all for the mimic to try to mimic the model species. So then the animal mimicry will not work. So again, if you change one factor in the entire 
in a Cree system, everything changes. And it's just amazing because in the natural world, there's millions of different factors that might change in that uh, system. So all things can happen. <laughs> amazing things we will never expect to see. I think we've got one last question now, Tianchi, coming from uh, Rohan. Oh, OK. Well, I see a comment on Guppies as well. Oh, you know the Guppies. Well done. You've done some very serious readings on the Guppy. And I'm coming to the last question. Active animal that is in a creature. Oh, thank you for the question. Um, it's hard to say. Again, it's hard to say. If we, again, if they're doing it in the perfect way, they're blending in perfectly into the background, and we don't even see them being there in the wild, maybe in the jungle, in the desert, somewhere in the marine, and we just don't even notice when we walk past them. Maybe. 10 different species or 1,000 1, different species with amazing animal mimicry skills have already died and we don't even know they were there in the first place. So it's hard to say. And um, again, if it's from the evolutionary biologist, biologist's point of view, it takes millions of years for anything to happen, for any uh, mimicry traits to develop, to be there. So our existence is not long enough or our modern technology, the industrial pollution, everything has not been there long enough to cause any effects. But um, we don't really have a clear answer. Maybe we have killed many different species. I don't know. And, and if we keep doing things in the way we have been doing, we might kill more species. But who knows? And somehow what we're doing might in a very strange way help some mimicry species i cannot think of a very good example but maybe if we what we're doing might actually be beneficial for the mimicry animals and just somehow helps it be more more useful yeah just all sorts of things can happen between human and amazing nature and you can never be sure. And that's what attracts me so much about being a studying biology and studying zoology. And hopefully that will get your some of your interest again. And um, eventually, if you decide to work in biology or any field that you're inter interested in, it's always nice to have a look around the amazing species that we have, millions of different species. And they're also beautiful and very important. And well, thank you for joining me today and thank you for listening. Thank you, Tianchi, for your wonderful talk. It has been fascinating. Uh, and for those of you who are sort of serious about contemplating studying biology, um, specifically at Oxford, we will be running a biology taster day later in the year. So do watch out. But please do join us again. Thank you very much from Balliol. Uh, from me and Tianchi and good night. Thank you.